of Creator Tooling. My name is Adam Posner. I'm the founder of Probably Nothing Talent, Web3 Recruiting, also host of the podcast, top global career podcast. Podcast. I say that all the time. Funny that I mess it up this time, but welcome everybody. We're going to go around the horn here and do a quick round of introductions and ladies first. Helen, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Um, so should I share my background or? Just a quick, quick intro. Tell us who you sure. are and what you do best. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Fireside. Fireside is the first interactive streaming platform that powers um, interactive community experiences for the top revenue generating franchises out there, like the global medium, Tyler Henry, um, Steve Harvey, um, uh, Chris Voss, FBA hostage negotiator and beyond. Before that, um, serial entrepreneur, last company was an AI company called Node um, and was the youngest employee at Google and YouTube. Awesome. Good stuff. We'll go around the horn here. Charlie, how's it going? Hey, everyone. Thanks for having me. Uh, so I'm Charlie. I'm the CEO of Cube. Uh, we are trying to provide a third space to creators and their audiences to engage and connect. So move away from pure connection based on pay me some money because you rate me or watch my adverts because uh, you rate me into do things that are relevant and valuable to me. So we call it behavioral loyalty, behavioral engagement. Come to me as a creator, do the things that are important to me, and I'll reward you. Pretty, pretty simple concept, hopefully. Pretty simple concept. That's what they all say. Charlie, welcome to the show. <laughs> Bradley, how's it going? Bottom left of our Hollywood squares. Hey guys, um, Bradley, how are you? I'm the founder of Roll. Uh, we introduced uh, social tokens uh, to Ethereum in 2019. If you guys have heard of tokens like Friends with Benefits or Whale or Alex or these sorts of things, we're behind a lot of those. Um, we did a billion and a half in volume in that time and we didn't get paid for it because uh, it was on Uniswap. So we're creating an L2 uh, for this category uh, later this quarter and uh, we'll kind of announce testnet and mean that soon. Good stuff. Thank you. Alex, how's it going? Good. So I'm the uh, founder of Azurus. Uh, Azurus lives at the intersection of blockchain, streaming and gaming. We essentially do playable ads that show up automatically on stream over the stream that gets everybody who's watching to play along and earn stuff. Uh, so usually those are branded. Uh, we work with some of the top brands. Uh, the tech works on any stream platform. We have like 20 million players on Twitch today. Uh, and we've been around since uh, 2018. So it's been, a, it's been a minute. Awesome. Good stuff. Love all the innovation happening here. And last but not least, Marcus. Marcus Frozen. Marcus over at LimeWire. How you doing, Marcus? He might be stuck. We will circle back with Marcus any moment here. We'll keep the show moving. So today's show, again, is the future of creator tooling, specifically around AI. And the conversation that a lot of folks are having is balancing authenticity with utilizing the technology. So I want to go around the horn again here and get your take on how creators could best utilize the tech at the same time, ensuring that the creator's voice is heard, that it resonates, and it's authentic. We'll start with you, Charlie. So look, our view is the relationships between creators and audiences are stronger than anywhere else for the most part. If you look at traditional enterprise brands, that the creator audience relationship is far stronger. Uh, I think all we want to do is, is use the technology to give more channels to be able to utilize that engagement. It's not about using AI or tooling to create false engagement, false relationships. It's automating it, simplifying it, streamlining it. So for us, we use AI to, to ultimately create campaigns. A creator can essentially upload content to us. We will then automatically create campaigns based on what that content looks like in the past, in the current, and in the future, and find quicker direct channels, micro engagements that, that they can hold with their audiences. We're not, we're not trying to, uh, to fake anything there. It's interesting too, when it comes to the engagement part two across social media and other content, I think that the audience, whether it be B2C or B2B is a bit more savvy these days in deciphering what is robotic and what is human. And those lines are being blurred. Sure. Fallon, Fallon, what's your take? How do we ensure authenticity? Well, I mean, I think with uh, generative AI and these deep fakes that are out there, I don't know if you guys saw the headlines about some um, uh, not very appropriate deep fakes of Taylor Swift Taylor. out there. Uh, yeah, sorry, Taylor Swift out there. Um, but I think it, it actually makes uh, the connection between fans and the talent that they that they love even more important to be as raw and authentic as possible and use kind of almost coming like removing the tech a bit and really just making it feel almost like an interactive FaceTime to engage. And that's where I think there's a big opportunity for 
live interactive moments where it's less about I'm, you know, buying another content subscription. It's more about I'm really going to be a part of a community where I get to, it's not a deep fake. I get to directly connect, um, you know, with the talent that I love, with the brands that I love. And, um, and I have assurances around that, which is a lot of what we are seeing today. I mean, a lot of the talent that we work with, they have deep fakes on social platforms. Um, for example, there's a deep fake of Steve Harvey on Instagram, you know, trying to sell you something. Um, and they've been trying to get that taken down from Instagram forever, but you know, on his network powered by Fireside, it's, it's, it's really a place that's no deep fakes. It's really him. And it's him, you know, wanting to help motivate his fans and help them elevate their lives through authentic, direct communications, kind of like what we're doing here. Um, so I think it just is going to give rise to more of those platforms that are really kind of guaranteeing that it's, it's, it's all about the talent going direct with their fans. Interesting. Bradley, I want to I want to build upon that and I want to get your take on how do we use AI to bridge that gap between the physical and digital worlds in, in the right way, in an ethically way and moving moving this train forward in the right direction. Yeah, I mean, it's it's weird times, definitely. I, I think the concept of, of kind of a maybe um, antithetical take, but um, yeah, I generally think the concept of uh, authenticity is going to kind of evolve over time. You're going to see things like certified copies. So there'll be, mm -hmm. there'll, be some, that's the, there'll be someone that will specifically create or is responsible for like the best fake Drake songs. And that'll that'll, that'll just be this it's happening. Little, yeah, that, that'll kind of be this new form of authenticity uh, that people will kind of consume uh, and, and the, the public will kind of, uh, determine what, what is authentic or inauthentic, uh, in that context. And it'll become composable. So you'll see people like, you know, like Grimes, uh, just kind of giving away their IP and, and, and music for, uh, other people to kind of, um, work with. And then, you know, that, 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 that kind of, you know, uh, in the past unofficial Grimes, uh, collaboration may, may be authentic in that capacity. We're really excited about, um, the blockchain side of this because there's, there's just provenance to, you know, what, what's actually happened from the creator. But even in this kind of AI remix co-creator or co-conspirator world, um, you, you, you'll still be able to kind of track, you know, uh, Grimes' original idea all the way to this and, you know, kind of kind of how that'll evolve across time. So having like a ledger uh, is uh, of, of, of that history uh, of what the creator's doing and how it's uh, being remixed is something we're really excited about. It's fascinating too, because the concept of remixing has been around since the dawn of, of time. And it's not even with electronic music. I mean, going back to the days of even, you know, classic rock and into the disco phase, you know, producers would take an original album, but now taking it onto the blockchain. And that, that could be manifested in a couple of ways where it comes to monetization, um, authenticity and all those elements too. Alex, what would you add here? It's an interesting topic. Yeah, there, there was, that's how we're was... talking about it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. No, that was a great uh, transition because the authenticity is not just about the face and what you show on media. I deal mostly in live streams. And on live stream, the, the authenticity comes also with how you interact with whatever feedback you get from the audience. The chat, which is as manageable as it can be, or any other things. And that's exactly where AI uh, comes into play. So we actually have been using AI from the beginning at uh, Azure's to analyze what's going on in the stream and have interaction proper based on context. Uh, and this has been part of a job from the day one because we realize that if you want to keep the interaction between a streamer and his audience authentic first you can't disturb him you can't expect him to have to work something else than being himself and being authentic and being focused on his show you can't like multitask and get away with it you just lose context you can't expect them to start clicking button and doing things it has to come front and center to them and they decide whether they want to act on this um, input or just let it go because it's not the right time for them and this is how you create authentic creation you essentially give control but not overwhelming control and uh, and use ai to really filter and create things that are meaningful that create moments where the creator and the audience can really connect have fun and be aligned and think or because the creator has something else in mind he's showing has control he does what he wants and that's, that's, a, that's how it's authentic that's that's a great take i mean we have a we have a pretty uh pretty esteemed panel here and i want to get your take on what tools you're seeing out there are really driving the creator economy when it comes to ai let's give some alpha to the crowd out there some of the cool tech some of the cool products you're seeing out there found what, what are you seeing in your world well i mean in terms of specific applications, I think, 
a lot of the tools that I'm seeing are sort of fall into this bucket of really powerful co-pilot tools for talent. So whether it's taking an idea, um, like a plot line around, you know, for, let's take a, like a, a writer, for example, a screenwriter. Um, now the kind of, you know, first draft of your idea, you can just prompt it with, you know, here's the, the thought process of the of the plot line and the system can actually just generate a storyline for you right and those are things that you can use chat gpt for but you can actually train it even better on your actual um you know writing training set right, your own um, bots. exactly and so i think there's and while it's so interesting because um in the hollywood entertainment world you know we very much fear new technologies because we've seen what they've done, right? In terms of certain industries. I think this is where there's a little bit of a fundamental misunderstanding of like the power of these co-pilot tools to help you make, make you more efficient and level up where the actual strategic value is from a creative perspective. And I think that's where it gets really exciting. Um, I, as also obviously with the generative AI side of things, um, making it just a lot cheaper and faster um, to create the actual, you know, images and videography um, for, you know, the various content. We're seeing examples of that. Um, on the collaboration side, someone mentioned Grimes. I think that's a really interesting idea. I think there's still a lot of regulation that needs to be put into place around sort of protecting whose IP. Yeah, you know, it, it, there was a, a, a lawsuit with, I don't know if it was Amy Poehler or someone else with ChatGPT around like taking the content that was public and training it on their system. So I think there's still a lot to be figured out around whose IP can be used for what um, and how that should be monetized. But I think that presents a massive opportunity, again, from a co-pilot perspective. I don't see AI ever kind of taking over in that sense and coming up with better and more novel, like the next Christian Nolan movie or whatever. Like that's not gonna happen from an AI system. I mean, I, I truly believe that we're still in the first at bat of the first inning, if I'm gonna use a, a sports analogy here. Charlie, what's your take? What are you seeing out there that's really getting you excited in the space tech-wise, platform-wise? Yeah, I agree with Fallon. I think it's, if you look at creators, especially the relationship and the value that creators bring is not in the imagery or even the exact words that are being used or the, the videography. It's the, the, the fundamental ideas that sit at the core of what it is they're doing. I think where the AI tooling is exciting is accelerating the, I don't want to say ancillary pieces, but the, the adjacent pieces, the imagery that, that helps me to extrapolate and externalize the, externalize the ideas I have. So I can use image generation to put ideas out into the world that would normally have taken me a week to create the imagery and, and the descriptors around it. I can do that much faster. The, the, and so everything we're seeing in Gen AI and GPT and all these things make it easier. I guess the risk is how far does it go? Do we, do we get to the point where you start to lose the, the core ideas that are there? It makes me nervous because I see a lot of investment going into those spaces. I see a lot of very cool tools that are offering creators the ability to create AI versions of themselves to interact with fans and audiences. You know, I, I can I can give you a, a chat bot that I can engage with my fans. Great. I, I can now have a one-to-one -one conversation with every single user, which is obviously impossible for any creator that has more than 10 fans, 10 followers. But while it might be trained on what I do and what I say, is it me? They're getting the same ideas. Where does that value exist? So on, on, on one side for creators, I think incredible. You can start to build these relationships in the same way brands can, because there is no one person in a brand. But where does that cut off come from a, uh, you know, I don't know, ethical, moral, philosophical perspective? I don't know. Well, that's 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 the story of life. How far could we could we push the push the limits here, Bradley? I definitely want to get your take, and Alex, I want to get your take. So I want to I want to get a quick hot take on the tech that you guys are seeing, and then I'll flip it back to you for the for the next round of questions. Bradley, what's uh, what's peaking your interest these days? Yeah, I mean, just like thought wise, this is like the first uh, like fully programmable century, like from mm -hmm. two thousand to twenty one hundred. This like first century of the of, of the internet, and so like what like um some of my creator friends, one of them has, has a blog called Other Life. He's a writer, and uh, he taught himself how to code with ChatGPT. So now he's teaching a class on how writers can learn how to code and the intersection of like coding and writing. Um, so I, I think a lot of uh, creators and different types of people are going to. Uh, learn how to code and, and create extremely creative applications and courses. And um, yeah, I think this is going to kind of be a, a big thing in the next couple of years. Alex, what would you add? 
Yeah, with that, like game creation, that's something I'm super passionate about. And we are this close. We actually have a working proof of concept uh, that we work on. We can have the audience and the creators together work just through prompts on building a small game. We're super very easy on trivia game, but even like Flappy Bird type of thing, uh, if you can describe it, it becomes today possible to create an, an experience that everybody gets to play at the same time together. Uh, and, and this is what it, where I'm getting super excited collaboration, removing uh, barriers of knowing how to code, making it super easy to just tell through a prompt, hey, make me a GPT, but this time I want to have instead of Flappy Bird, uh, make me a like Flappy Bird, replace the bird with, uh, I don't know, like a Superman and uh, and put the uh, logo of the channel on in the sky and people have to avoid um, and to, to collect as many as they can in 30 seconds. And here you go, everybody can start playing together for 30 seconds. And this is the type of thing that just because a co-building, co-creation live on stream uh, creates really a unique experience. I think we're going to see more and more of that in the future. Marcus, let's build on. I'm sorry, Marcus is trying to trying to chime in here, um, having some tech issues. Hopefully, be able to join us in a moment here. But Alex, let's build on that for a moment. I want to switch gears to, obviously, the the hot the hot tech product du jour, the the Apple Vision Pro that came out um, in the last few days. Well, the 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 retail version of that. Um, how is it all tying in with this VR AR experience and and specifically around gaming? I personally think gaming is going to be the, the the killer app, especially as we head into Web three for mass adoption. But how is a Vision Pro from a um, from an application standpoint going to help accelerate that curve, or not? I, I can definitely. So I love and hate the Vision Pro. <laughs> so I, can have that to I hate I seeing people it. walking around the streets with it. Like mm -hmm. I'm scared they're going to walk into things, get hit by cars. The thing though that um, really connects with the way we see the future. So when I when I explain Azure, I always say we turn that TV in your house into a virtual seat in a virtual stadium. Uh, that's always the way I think it because we're making it interactive. So all of a sudden you can start like uh, playing t-shirt toss with everybody else who's watching, and essentially. The the, uh, the Vision Pro is just allowing us to create overlays anywhere you want, and you can create those touch points and it just like you don't have a device anymore that's standing on a wall on the on the desk that becomes that screen the world is a screen you can have as many screens as you want at different depths of it kind of fascinating to think about it that way uh, now it basically that thing turns your universe into layers mm, that's interesting maybe actually 3d layers and and and, uh, and the, this yeah and so essentially a lot of the work that we've been doing at creating layers over streams uh, you're like, oh, wow, this is much bigger playground. <laughs> That's going to be fun. I dig it. Uh, Fallon, in your world um, with events and experiences, how are you incorporating VR and AR? Um, so actually, this past weekend, I, I saw you two at the Sphere in Vegas. Um, and I really think that that's the future of sports and entertainment in some ways. And obviously from, you know, you don't have to go travel to Vegas and go to Sphere to experience it that way. You'll be able to just do it sort of, you know, from the comfort of your own couch. Um, and, you know, I think this is sort of the the first iteration of you have to wear something. Eventually it'll become contact. Eventually it's just whatever something you embed in yourself. I don't know. Um, but uh, the tech kind of goes away. So, I mean, I think in terms of really cool applications right now, we're seeing a lot of it on the experience, uh, experiment, experiential marketing side of things in terms of playing around with VR. I think there's definitely some um, opportunities to, um, you know, deepen it, but I think it's going to take time before, you know, before that becomes a little bit more mainstream beyond just like a, a gimmicky fun marketing thing. Um, but that being said, I mean, you know, there's, you look at, uh, you know, 3D sort of, um, you know, movies that you've seen in the past, which we've all experienced. And like, that's kind of scratching the surface as to what's possible. Um, and so, you know, I think it's super exciting from an entertainment perspective, um, especially as this tech continues to get more advanced. It's so funny. I was joking with one of my friends the other day and someone had a picture of the original. I was, it was like South by 2015. And I remember having it. I have like the Google cardboard that went that attached to the phone. And how far we've come in 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 nine years, like it's it's crazy the acceleration of technology. Curtis, I want to get your take on this that that intersection between VR, AR, and infusing that with with the AI tech. Um, give us a good stuff, man. Um, so we don't work directly in that space at the moment. We've worked in well from a consumer so perspective, in, even interactive space, right? So we've worked with right. a music artist to build interactive music videos where 
the role you play in that video earns you rewards with that person. The next step for that is we are looking at AR as application. So you look at things like Pokemon Go, right, which is still the thing that everyone goes back to for AR, and the level of engagement people got there with Incredible. with nothing really on the other side, purely a game. If you add the, the, the creator lens to that as well, and you provide people with a new channel to interact, um, similar to what Alex was saying, right, you, you give people more interest, more reason to actually participate, move them away from being passive into being active, and suddenly every ad, every ad, every touch point, everything you do can become an active relationship and, and touch point. And that's what excites but, us about AR VR. It just extends that channel but, out into something I can touch and feel rather than something that is just pushed in front of my eyes. But when it, when is it too much, Bradley? When, 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 what are the limitations here? When is it, when is it overkill? When is it too much? When is it completely unnecessary? Or... Or are we in this F around and find out phase of innovation and, and seeing what works and what doesn't again, you know, so early in the in the timeline of, of this tech? Yeah, I um I guess I have another hot take, but like I I, I don't Go really I don't really see um like um uh like the Apple Vision Pro as like the next big form factor of of uh, of of the internet per se. I think it'll have a moment, maybe like five X as big as like Google Glass. Um, but I, I think people are, are more excited about um, the idea of like humanoid robots or some sort of like omnipresent Iron Man Jarvis style. Um, well, so companies like Figure and Tesla Bot and maybe anyone that will create that omnipresent uh, kind of version is, is going to be a lot more interesting. Just going back to like kind of how people felt with like if anyone had like um, an Alexa or like a Google Home, there was like it just felt like a companion, but you always wanted more. And so I, I think that that'll be kind of the promise that people uh, deliver on versus like um, any sort of like goggle internet scenario. That's a, that's a great take. And Alex, like, you know, the, the, the next buzzword out there is spatial computing, which has been around for a bit, but now in, in everyone's ears, uh, is it here to stay? Is this the future? And how are creators going to learn, adapt and build in this space? That's a wide question. You know, I had the- uh, the f <laughs> Just the throw it all out there. You could answer it any way you want. <laughs> I had the first Google Glasses back in the day, so I'm full on board and like drinking that Kool-Aid about special computing. I think this this is really fascinating when you when the space around you becomes part of your interaction with machines, then then there's definitely so many opportunities. Now the uh, to to Bradley's point, like uh, Vision Pro, I don't know. I I gotta say I do love the MetaQuest Three, so it's way more approachable, like budget wise. Uh, and I think they did a stellar job with this this late, latest upgrade. So this is my favorite playground personally. And yes, it's it definitely. I think it's here to stay. It's not going anywhere. The fact, like, look, if anything has told us, there's signs all over science fiction over the past twenty years of how we expect to have interfaces that blend within our space. So whether they're going to come through a screen in front of your eyes, through a neural link implant, through a contact lens, this is going to happen. Right. Uh, now it's a question of tech, of time, uh, and other things that us as founder care about because starting too early is never usually not a good idea. But the uh, the vision, I think there has been so much education of the entire population in the world through movies and um, and content that the day that you see a minority report, uh, UI style UI pop up, you're not even surprised anymore. You understand what's going on. The real question is like, what's going to make it pop up for my mom? Yeah. It's, it's, I always say that about tech. Explain it to my mom. Explain to my mom why she needs this. Explain to my mom what an NFT is, why she needs blockchain. Aid. It's behind the scenes because most of these folks don't need to know how the sausage is made, just the experience on 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 the human side there. I want to I go around with one last question before we we wrap it up with a final question. But Fallon, let's talk about community, um, another, another word that gets thrown around a lot. But how do we ensure that the latest tools out there are really facilitating and enabling the right development and nurturing of, of online communities? So I think the most important thing that we think about at Fireside is very much around um, ownership of your community, because today so much of the global community and fandoms today live on platforms you don't own, like on social or faceless listeners in a podcast. And so a big thing that 
um, that we focus on, you know, with our partners is helping them grow their own audience. And owning that audience also means owning the data around that audience, being able to contact them directly, not having algorithms, you know, be stepping in and taking your amazing content and the platforms choosing who gets to see it because they're going to make more money from ads by showing someone else an impression versus your own community. So I think that's a really, really important thing is, is for um, talent and brands and IP owners to be really clear of making sure that what platforms they are actually building their communities on are ones that they have control of their communities and can directly communicate with them and own that relationship with them directly. I think the second piece then is how do you then nurture that relationship? And that's super, super important. And obviously, you know, you might be selling products to your community. You might be touring, you know, sell tickets so that they can like come see you in a physical venue. Um, but at the, you know, content, but at the end of the day, the most direct form of nurturing a relationship with your super fans, you know, those people that are willing to also spend 80% more than the average person is going to be through directly kind of communicating with them and providing a intimate space where you are your most authentic self, not highly produced or any of that. Mm. Um, and being able to actually, you know, create a, a kind of hub where you're engaging with them and sharing with them different aspects of your life than you would normally. Um, and that's really what we're seeing drive a lot of success for our partners. Um, and, uh, and those, you know, that have been known for so many things in terms of just the mainstream perspective and really being able to now take all the value that they put out there, like the FBI hostage negotiator, Chris Foss, you know, he's created the first interactive negotiation network where he's coaching people, him and his eight coaches on how to improve their negotiation skills. You've read his book, you've taken his masterclass. This is the next step of relationship and community that you can now be a part of to win at business together. Oh, great take there. Charlie, same question. Uh, look, I think it's give people a place to build a community and give them a reason to build a community. So community, there's the intrinsic value, which is my place within the community. We are, you know, a, a tribal species. We're used to operating in groups through a common intersection interest, whether it's where we are, what we believe in, what we care about. With brands of creators now, we're trying to build communities around that individual piece, what we believe, what we care about. So there is also the, the extrinsic value, which is the brand coming through and saying, if you are part of this community, if you're acting in this community, I will reward you. I will recognize that and I will reward you both with status amongst your peers and with absolute clear value, whether that is tickets to shows or content, et cetera. And then the other side is giving them a place to do it where they feel they can be open, they can speak, they can engage. To Fallon's point, it, it just doesn't work on the big data oligarchs the Facebooks and stuff, because I know full well as an individual that the brand, the creator I care about, they're not in control of that community. They want to control of it other than the, the one entity that is purely trying to look to monetize that as much as possible. And it just doesn't create the right incentives for people to be open and honest and engaged. And, you know, I'm giving up my data and, and every individual now it, buoyed on by the opportunities in the market saying, I want to own my data. I want to be in control of where that's used. I'm not going to give you all of the insight into me as an individual by engaging in this community. If I know you're going to sell that data or, or do something with it, I don't agree with. So having those spaces that are brand and community co-owned, co-created, co-controlled, I think is, is essential. That's that's a that's a great take there. And I, I do want everyone the opportunity to answer that question, but we are hitting our time limit here. So I want to go around the horn real quick. And we're going to start with Bradley. And if you could just give us a quick hot take on um, on what are you most scared of in this space that we should keep top of mind as we build out the tech of AI and tell folks where they could find you and when they can connect with you? I'm scared of AI politics. Uh, so I'm scared of how this intersects with our political oh. landscape. Uh, this is a big election year for the planet. Um, there's lots of lots of elections happening, uh, lots of decisions that are going to be made. And uh, we've all seen what happened, um, regardless of your political background, in the past like four years. Um, you know, we're, and then add AI onto that. Yep. Um, it's going to be insane. Cool. Uh, but yeah, find me at, um, you know, Bradley underscore Miles underscore at Twitter or uh, shoot me an email, bradley at tryroll.com. Cool. Thanks, man. Alex. 
Well, it's hard to top that one because definitely this is very scary <laughs> it's stuff. Like everyone. <laughs> right there is hundred percent right here. But I think the um, what, what I'm scared of, if I would use a scare worst case, is like making sure that people don't like use AI as a instead of their own judgment. Because uh, it's so easy mm. now as a creator to essentially just like ask ChatGPT, what should I be doing? Give me a new topic. Uh, essentially scripting yourself and you become the puppet of the AI. It's and, and I'm serious. Uh, and so I think it's important to realize that it's in, in, back to the, your first question about authenticity. Authenticity is about knowing your voice, knowing who you are and why you're here and why you're connecting with this audience and what this audience wants from you and like why they like being here. And this is your identity, and that's something that's unique, and that has to be uh, that you need to, to 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 nurture, and not just listen blindly to what the AI may tell you. That if you do that, you may increase by 0.1 percent the amount of people watching or the duration of the uh, of the uh, of the, the session. Uh, and I think that's uh, that's something that we uh, we have to uh, to to stay human essentially. Cool. And Alex, where can folks find you and connect? Uh, you can find me on uh, Azuris.io on uh, my uh, ZatMonkey, Z-A-T-M-O-N-K-E-Y, pretty much on every single platform out there. Good stuff. Thank you so much. Fallon, what's, what's keeping you up me, at night these days? What's keeping me up at night is uh, the inability to verify the provenance of anything. Um, so how are we, like, what's even real? Like, I already don't really trust the news. I don't even watch the news. Like, at deep fakes, I mean, Bradley, you're talking about fear around politics and AI. I think we've already, we've already experienced that. It's just going to get, the tech is better and better. So how do we know what's real and what's not? And conversely, um, you know, people kind of hiding behind these, these sort of AI technologies, using them as a way to solve loneliness, which then means a total lack of actual true social interactions. Um, so all of that kind of freaks me out. I don't really see many solutions out there. It's great that there's certain companies that are trying to explore verifying what's deep fakes or not, but the tech is so good that it's really I don't good. know. Yeah. And where could folks find you, connect and learn more? Uh, Fallon Fatemy or uh, firesidechat.com. Good stuff. And Charlie, bring us home here. What's keeping you up at night in this space? What do we need to watch out for? Simple one, pace of technological change, uh, outpacing our capacity to understand it and control it. That's it. I think as a, as a group, as a society, we are grossly unable to, to comprehend the speed of development here. And, and that's going to have impacts on regulation, on trust, on, on all of this stuff. So that, that, Good that's stuff. it. Let's be aware Good of all uh, Charlie at cube.com. Awesome. And this has been a fantastic panel. I want to thank Drew, Alana, and Lauren, and everyone over at Redbeard, and all the sponsors and everyone for making this possible. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Adam Poser. You can find me on LinkedIn and you can check out my podcast, thepodcast.com. And uh, that'll do it. On to the next session. Thanks, everybody. This has been a Red Beard Ventures production.